आफ्टरनून एंड वेलकम टू सी गुरुकुल लेक्चर टुडे इज फिफ्थ सेप्टेम्बर सेलिब्रेटेड एज टीचर डे टू मार्क द बर्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ डॉक्टर सर्वपल्ली राधा कृष्ण हु हिमसेल्फ वॉज अ टीचर एंड एन एजुकेटर एंड ही बिलीव द टीचर कुड प्ले अ सिग्निफिकेंट रोल इन क्रिएटिंग द फ्यूचर्स ऑफ अ नेशन एंड इन दिस today it gives me an immense pleasure to discuss and work of my supervisor my mentor my teacher who has had impact on my life and modeled me according to what i desired to be a teacher myself so all thanks to all the teachers of my life and a very happy teachers day to them so let us today in this work to understand the contribution of professor mathri choudhury to sociology she is an eminent sociologist who just retired from the center of social study of social system jawaharlal nehru university and is a uh, present is the north south director at a uh, international university that is university of washington so in how work today we will try to reflect on some of the key work or the key areas that she has contributed and let us kind of say that this is not exhaustive this is just a brief discussion of her work in order to get a holistic or a complete idea of the work of professor mathri choudhury it is important to read as he has widely published in renowned journals uh, uh, international and national level all her articles are available online and in journals so let's kind of give this tribute and start reading the work of our teachers let us begin with the basic idea of how she visualizes sociology and how this is kind of a distinct discipline separate from common sense according to professor choudhury the practice of a theoretically mindful sociology is therefore critical for a just and democratic society social theory in other words is kind of contextual it depends on the history on the context in which it is produced it is very important to understand that there is no immaculate conception of social theory social theory emerge in specific historical context and it is important for us to understand not only the context within which theories emerge but also the way in which they root through the life or they are able to entangle through our own life prefather choudhury expresses her concern that invited her into doing theory one of the title of her book is doing theory which she has co-edited with manish thakur one of the concern is the commitment to social theory and the need to engage with it if we were to practice social science in any serious fashion this in turn rests upon an understanding that sociology as a discipline studies common sense but yet it is kind of goes beyond what is obvious it is a, a discipline which is equipped to debunk taken for granted knowledge or what we would call common sense so sociology goes beyond common sense which is usually partial and often prejudiced and discriminatory so we need to kind of understand uh, sociology concepts only when we have a clarity of term Professor Choudhury points out at the lack of clarity in using certain terms like national and global which are loosely deployed in understanding social change these terms like national global traditional modernity are buzzwords they are kind of used very uh, uh, easily or are commonly used by a number of scholars without going into the context of its production and circulation so that is a problem that needs to be kind of looked into it carefully she stresses on the need to break away from a culture where social science discourse is being taken over by a managerial discourse In her book The Practice of Sociology and the Sociology of India Intellectual and Institutional Discourse she deploys a clarity in using these terms global national and these terms would help us to then develop 
a more clear picture of social transformation taking place. And one process which is very critical to understand India's society was globalization. So in an essay titled Globalization in Indian Sociology, she addresses the new empirical reality that globalization has brought about in India and to investigate the reason for the overexposure of some of these realities and the neglect of other. She question raises a number of questions. Why did Indian sociology receive so much of attention at a period of globalization driven by the development of new metropolitan area, a growing middle class and a culture of consumption? So if we read sociology of India at this particular point of time, we see a lot of Western scholars bringing in a lot of work on middle class, on culture of consumption in India, how globalization was affecting social change. So it, India became the object of study by a number of scholars. The reason for this was that there was a kind of an absence or there was a parochial bigotry which was negating the idea of India as existing in the rural area or the sociology of labor or for that matter a lot of things which were very integral to India. So why this was happening and to find answers to it, Professor Chaudhary draws attention to two important facts. Number one, that it could be the result of dominant intellectual tradition of Indian sociology. And two, it was kind of something which was found in everyday local practice. So the idea that much of the un discourse of even sociology in India in the initial uh, period was dominated by the Orientalist and there was a kind of an intellectual uh, uh, space which kind of documented a lot on globalization, class, uh, middle class and the other, which kind of created the other part of India as invisible and that is what became problematic. The twofold approach stems from an understanding that Indian society's tryst with globalization cannot be understood by a restrict focus on intellectual ideas alone but through the convoluted ways that the concept of globalization, like other concepts, global north, or traveled into a classroom, a syllabi and a common sense. So it is kind of not something where we could understand India only in terms of the grand narratives or grand theorization which was coming in from the West or from outside. What was also important to look into the way in which it was emerging in the classroom and it was the way in which uh, it was being experienced in everyday life. And that takes us to the second uh, work of Professor Chaudhary, that is Sociology in India, Intellectual and Institutional Practices. This collection documents some of the institutional and intellectual practices that are still being used in sociological research and teaching in India. It provides documentation and theorizing of the, on the present trends in the context of globalization. It covers a wide range of issues which are actually being practiced or which are actually being a part of the institutional framework. And this would be completely different from the uh, grand uh, structured way in which sociology was uh, in India was understood. An earlier nationalist vision of education that informed much of social science practice in independent India is challenged. So this is also a time where you had this divide between the uh, idea of India or uh, being in kind of uh, inferior to the West. The Western culture was portrayed as superior, as kind of having that cultural capital where and therefore it was time to negate this idea and the imperatives of global capital uh, uh, on the other hand. Indian sociology was no longer defined as a mixture of Western and local. The field in India can no longer be defined in terms of intellectual script. So it cannot be kind of uh, someone sitting in the West and theorizing India, giving us a script that this is uh, uh, what is India. For instance, if we were to look into how India was defined in terms of a shift from 
caste to class or from joint family to nuclear family so it was no longer possible to understand society in india through this intellectual script sociology in india has evolved as a set of practice operating in the classroom in the curricular and in the academic spaces this uh, third work which is very significant is to understand her feminist contribution is the work on gender and the indian nation state so in this paper professor chaudhry reviews the way in which women have been treated throughout the development of indian nation this was writing at a time when there was this discourse on women in development and the need to kind of transform policies and programs at the state level that could be beneficial for the uh, women she outlines three ways that the na- national movement and later the indian state envisioned the role of women first women as agent and recipient of development so this was the debate in going on in the development sector that women could become an agent of development the other was that if the development takes place the first beneficiary would be the women the second was women's political participation in the nation as equal citizen of a state that does not discriminate on grounds of gender so this was again a part of the women's movement which was kind of uh, for fighting for the political rights of women in terms of considering them as equal uh, citizen of the state and the third which is very important and which comes in from the national uh, struggle for independence was women as em- emblems of national culture so the idea that if women was kind of uh, progressive or it was kind of empowering then the image of the nation uh, as a state would enhance and therefore much of the development programs and policies were catering to the uh, improvement in the life of women the three elements of how women fit into nationalism and the nation building reflect three features of national movement that were critical to the creation of indian nation and what are these first was that it was found on a well developed critique of colonialism in its economic aspect and on an economic program leading to independent economic development so the whole critique of colonialism we do find the role of nation state in term of enhancing the role of women in term uh, in kind of making women more economically independent and participating in the economic process the second was the movement was combined to political democracy and civil liberties building block as uh, women regarded as building blocks of nation making and third was the cultural critique of colonialism where we look into women as emblem of nation state and here we kind of constructed a, a image of indian womanhood which would be again separate from what would be the image of women per se in other parts of the world the next area of work in which she has contributed significantly is gender and advertisement so professor mathri chaudhry worked on media and advertisement since 1990 and argues that both have shifted from traditional discourse to modern that is the real, how media discourses has changed and even the way in which look into advertisements what is the message that they convey to the mass in tune with the paradigm of development advertisements and gender images in the english print media in india rest on the assumption that the shift in the indian state's economic policy in favor of globalization as accompanied a shift in public dif- discourse as evident in the media many representation of indian women are fresh suggesting a shift from older model even though some are classic the idea of the homemaker and the uh, the idea of the homemaker and the mother modern advertisements features significantly more male models and it has been argued that this is because liberalization has ushered in new ideas of what it means to be a man including both traditional and contemporary ideas of power and success so in that sense the media or advertisements played a significant role especially in the 1990s in 
portraying a changed version of what it was to be a male or a female, a changed version of femininity and masculinity and much of this image, gender image was linked to the uh, larger picture of development or larger picture of liberal economy. Strong ideas of individual achievement, enjoyment and identity are differently being incorporated for both men and women. The great portion of Indian men and women have been effectively excluded from public discourse by the emphasis on achievement and a glamorous lifestyle. So when we look into the uh, idea of a contribution to gender study, we looked into gender and advertisement. Another area which she has contributed is to look into the social movement and here the relationship of nationalism and women movement. In this article, she argues that Indian nationalism was a cultural critique of colonialism and an assertion of national culture. The, this idea of nationalism emerged because there was a kind of com competitive uh, uh, comparison with the West. And it, in this sense of comparison, the understanding that there needs to be a unique idea of India as a cult, uh, nation state, India's cultural identity being separate from the West and the demand or the desire to create kind of change the image of India that the British, British colonial uh, discourse has created, the nationalism as an ideology emerged. The category created by the nationalist ideas, Indian women movement was started by nationalist men unlike women's movement and other, in other parts of the world. So there was a kind of a close linkages with this nationalist urge to kind of create a discourse that could uh, be beneficial to everyone. They were, the way the nationalist leaders dealt with the women question was critiqued and was later questioned by a number of feminists. So there's a lot of uh, critique to the understanding of what role nationalist or the reform mo movement uh, kind of played in terms of supporting the women's movement. Was it actually beneficial for the women or there was kind of uh, restructuring of the patriarchal relation between men and women? Professor Matri Chaudhary argues that like modernity and capitalism, feminism too entered India through colonialism. Feminists argue that it is necessary to look critically at women's question because it forms a collective identity of Indian women and the consciousness of women's movement. Professor Chaudhary argues how the nationalist movement and later the Indian state imagined the role of Indian women. The ways, uh, some of the ways that she has listed out in her work are, which has, uh, is women as agent and recipient of development, women's political participation in the nation uh, as equal citizen of a state, and women as emblem of national culture, which creates the image of an Indian womanhood. In her another work, Feminism in India, Professor Chaudhary brings together the writing of prominent Indian academics and activists as they debate the issue in context of Indian culture, society and politics and explores the theoretical foundation of feminism in India. For most of us, the uh, idea comes in that feminism is something which comes in from the West because much of the gender studies in the initial schooling days are through fem Western feminist writer. But then there are people like uh, Professor Maitri Chaudhary who has given us our own indigenous understanding of feminism and how it kind of contribute to theorization of gender and gender relation in Indian society. The inevitability of the association with Western feminism, the status of women in colonial and independent India, and the more recent challenge to Indian feminism posed by the tide of globalization and the upsurge of Hindu rights in India politics are discussed in length in this edited volume, Feminism in India. 
bridging the academic and activist personal political and local global divide so these are some of the binaries which have been uh, central in the discipline of sociology say the academic and the activist so the academic is dealing with empirical theory whereas the activist is uh, seeing the reality in their everyday life the uh, second dichotomy was the personal and political which comes in from the women's movement and then in terms of understanding social transformation the dichotomy of local and global the work in uh, feminism in india uh, professor choudhury shows how the movement is part of the larger project of consolidating the liberal views of secularism and democracy it deepens our understanding of why despite the existence of legal and constitutional right to prevent discrimination women are subjective to oppressive practices like dowry ultimately the feminist voice merges with the voice of all disadvantaged and discriminated groups engaged in the battle for the recognition of difference another significant work which uh, has to be discussed is the practice of sociology this book grew out of a need to examine the practice the teaching and research of sociology in india the need was in turn prompted by experience of the contributors as students and teachers of problems of understanding communicating the connection between sociology and society in which one lives and between sociological theory and empirical study this book is a quite a di- a different from the texts that we see or the books that we see but much of the uh, books which are in the discipline would be kind of giving you uh, theories or work of uh, renowned scholars here is a book which is coming in from the actual practitioners of sociology so it gives us a nuanced understanding of how sociology as a discipline is actually being practiced rather than just reading theoreticians or founding figures and uh, great scholars another book which is very significant is the work refashioning india gender media and a transformed public discourse this book was published in 1991 the and was looking into a lot of debate this is basically an uh, uh, book which uh, takes into account all the number of work research work and articles that had been published since earlier time and therefore it makes a good sense of not only theorization of sociology but the empirical social political transformation which was taking place in india so 1991 as we are all aware is a kind of a water uh, uh, mark in the history of india because it takes us to a new discipline uh, or to a new realm where the indian state followed the path of uh, neoliberalization and it led to the demand of market a public discourse that had till then been defined by self reliance equity and austerity had to be refashioned and that is why the title is refashioning india you have a new political economic political discourse which is helping us to look into the reality from a different angle so the one eight class which was significantly affected by the uh, new economic political policy was the indian middle class and they learned that thrift was not a virtue and shopping was legitimate pleasure this period that is post 1991 witnessed other significant development and these developments are the rise of hindutva assertion of marginalized caste and increasing institutionalization of feminism the book refashioning india gender media and a transformed public discourse details how consumerism combined with the ideas of individualism empowerment and choice in a contemporary public culture paved the way for an instant feel good and then aggressive nationalism refashioning india maps this process through a compilation of the author's work 
written at different points in time from the early 1990s through the next two decades up to the mid 2017 and when we look into this wide uh, range uh, decade uh, all uh, we see a uh, large scale changes taking place in india and whether it be political uh, economic media uh, academic discourse and it is uh, in indeed a significant contribution to have brought all this into a kind of one um, book the different chapters offer detailed studies of advertisements everyday details of english language print media the communicative abundance of television the danger of instant access and unequal ignorance and the dynamics of a transformed public sphere so we have kind of briefly discuss the major work that uh, professor maitri choudhury has contributed and indeed we agree uh, owe a lot to her in terms of both as a sociologist a scholar and a teacher who has so much to teach to her students with this i come to an end of this lecture and again a very happy teachers day to all my teachers and all my colleagues thank you